coordinate system x, um, which is my no current notation in, this, in these notes for the patch. So this really is the pullback of beta. This, this right over here is the pullback of beta under the x map, is what that really is. But when you flesh out the details for R3, and you look at the flux form of a vector field, it's exactly the surface area integral we study in Calculus 3. So, but two, can you integrate a two-form over a one-dimensional space? No. Over three-dimensional space? No. Two-forms get integrated over two-dimensional things. One-forms over one-dimensional things. Three-forms over three-dimensional things. That's kind of a big adjustment from Calculus 3, where we learned to integrate vector fields in like a bunch of different ways, right? Well, now we're saying no. <laughs> There is, a, there is a preferred mode of integration, and you can't, without doing some ad hoc nonsense, do otherwise. Um, but here is the actual proof in all of its glorious formulaics. Um, yeah. Here's an actual example. We wouldn't want to actually look at that, would we? Um, here's the integral of a three form. Again, this is the formula for the pullback of gamma. All right, and then finally, here's my, my lame definition of the integral of a p-form. Rather than giving you the pullback, I actually just give you a formula in my notes. All right. That leads us to the generalized Stokes theorem, which is absolutely beautiful. It says the following. It says that if we integrate the differential of a, um, of a p-form, over some surface or some manifold, then that's the same as integrating the form over the boundary of the manifold. Now, I know I haven't carefully defined boundary, but the fact of the matter is I'm going to assign you homework problems, and they're still going to make sense. OK? Because it's the boundary. You, you'll figure it out. It's, it's, it, 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 it's, not, it's not as bad as it sounds. I mean, it's, you know what, I could spend two weeks developing these half charts and doing everything carefully. And you know what, at the end of the day, it wouldn't help you a, a bit with the homework anyway. And um, since we're just interested in doing homework and not interested in understanding that, that, that uh, no, I'm sorry, wrong class, wrong class. But uh, um, <clears throat> anyway, so it's worth going through the list here. Fundamental theorem of calculus, if we integrate the one form df, right, that amounts to this. But on the other hand, the boundary, what is the boundary? Well, the boundary of the interval A to B is the set AB. So this becomes that, and that becomes that. And so the generalized Stokes theorem says fundamental theorem of calculus with the proper interpretation. By the way, this is part of a larger story, the story of chain homotopy. To, general, to like prove the generalized Stokes theorem correctly, we'd actually have to describe on how, 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 you, how you take a k-dimensional space and like chop it into pieces. We have to find what's called a, like a triangularization of it. And then you, you prove the generalized Stokes theorem for like a basic region in the triangularization. And then you sort of go from there. It's like what we did in Calculus 3, where, which we chopped things into pieces, proved it for a piece, and then took the limit as the number of pieces went to infinity and did some, well, we didn't do the analysis, but we said you could. Right. It, that same thing ha can be done in k dimensions if you study um, these things called um, k, like k faces, basically. There's some decomposition into k faces. This is. This is like we're taking a one dimensional space and we're just the boundary of it into a zero dimensional thing that has this two point. Right. The zero dimensional things are finite set spaces. Right, yeah. And so, and that's the boundary, is the, I mean, that one dimensional thing has that two point set as its. It's an ordered two-point set, so that's why the B has a plus and the A has a minus. There, that is not just ad hoc. That's part of like a larger story that I'm not getting into this semester. Of course, you can just as well talk about functions from R3 to R, in which case this is the differential. So if you integrate the form, it looks like that. But that's exactly the, the integral of the gradient on the flip side. The boundary, it's still the two-point difference. And there you go, fundamental theorem of calculus for line integrals. Also, generalized Stokes theorem. Green's theorem, you may recall, this guy. So if you look at the differential of this vector field, uh, m comma n, well, that 
is this, which is that, which if you flip the y and the x gives you partial n, partial x minus partial n, partial y. In other words, it's the flux field of this guy. And so if we say the integral of omega f over the boundary, which in this case is actually the, the, you know, the, the boundary of the simply connected region in the plane, um, well, that should be the, that's this line integral, which is that. But on the other hand, generalized Stokes theorem says that's also equal to the integral of d omega f over d, which is the integral of this over d, which is the area integral. That's exactly that. So Green's theorem is the generalized Stokes theorem. Gauss's theorem is the generalized Stokes theorem because this is really, what's this mean? I mean, this is, this, uh, <clears throat> this is the, uh, I supposed to make you guys do that in your homework or did we already do it? I don't know. Eventually I'll get around to asking you guys to do it, but um, I may I'll put on the next test or something, whatever, but uh, that's a nice problem actually, but uh, it's not that hard. So, yeah, that's what, this is just notation um, over the boundary of V, that's, this being equal to that is the generalized Stokes theorem, but this is that area integral. So, there you have it, this being equal to that is equivalent to that being equal to that, but this, of course, is the generalized Stokes theorem, yet again. And then, of course, Stokes theorem. Last but not least, Stokes theorem is equivalent to the fact that the integral of the derivative of the work form is e over the surface is equal to the integral of the work form over the boundary of the surface. This being the curl, that being the line integral around the edge. So I just, I just love this stuff. I think it's just so neat. You stupid adapter. I will kill you where you stand. All right. So now that you're properly tired, let's talk about Poincaré Lama. Someone poke, poke King. Kick his foot. Kick his foot. Okay. I didn't want to, I don't want you to miss this. I, I, <clears throat> there is a precedent for it. Min slept through me talking about this once upon a time. So. He's your, your, your predecessor in, in successful contest math. Are you still tired from the contest? The contest? How was the contest, you guys? You both did it, right? I solved a couple. Solved a couple? Wow, that's more than I'll do. You missed the contest? Oh, you wanted it? You wanted to go to it? I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just, I'm very happy that Dr. Majerik has taken it over. Like, woo! <laughs> sorry. So. Um, <clears throat> So this is the, the Poincaré Lemma, and um, I, I think I can, I, I can explain this in about 15 minutes, and then we'll, we'll go. It's absolutely the most beautiful calculation I'll share with you this whole semester, I think, without a question. So we've already proved this, right? D squared is zero. And so we have two kinds of forms. We have what? We have exact forms and we have closed forms, right? So, what's exact, what's closed? So let's say alpha is exact implies alpha is equal to d gamma for some gamma. Alpha, clo um, let's say um, beta closed just means that d beta is equal to zero. So it's pretty clear that if alpha is exact, then alpha is closed, right? Because d of d gamma is zero. But the other direction is what's interesting. If um, beta is closed on blank subset of Rn, 
then in fact we can say that beta is equal to d phi for appropriate choice of phi. It's exact. But we need to fill in the blank because it's not just without qualification. <clears throat> I think I have a cautionary tale coming up here next. All exact forms are closed. However, there exist closed forms which are not exact. Here's, here's, here's the counterexample. And this is the same counterexample I will show you in Calculus 3 if you take it with me. Um, so if you look at phi is 1 over x squared plus y squared x dy minus y dx, you may verify that d phi equals 0 in your homework. Well, I may not have actually given you that as a homework. I'm sorry if I didn't. But it's not hard to do. You just take the exterior derivative of this thing work it out, and you, you get that the exterior derivative of this is zero because of the way it's arranged, all right? And yet, that's not an exact form. I mean, this is closed, but it's not exact. If it were exact, it would mean that there's uh, phi um, equal to df, would have to be df, where f is satisfying partial f partial x equals that, and partial f partial y equals that. These are solved by like inverse tangent of y over x, where c is arbitrary. Um, and this is unavoidable. If you work it out carefully, there is always a defect. Because what this is, is the differential of the angle function. This is, this is d theta, written in Cartesians is what that is. So that's why you can't find a theta which goes all the way. I mean, you can't find theta which is differentiable in the entire plane. You, you can do it for the slit the slit plane, if you, you know, remove the angle degeneracy, that's fine, you can do that. But if you go all the way around, you can't get theta, which is differentiable. You can't even get it continuous. Um, so, that's a counterexample. This is an example of a closed form, which is not exact, on the punctured plane. So the punctured, the plane with a point removed at the origin, will not fit this condition over here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hallway people. So the question then is, <clears throat> can we follow Poincaré? Can we construct this phi? Can we construct the potential? And what's the data that you need? It turns out what you need is this thing called the k-lemma. So let's talk about the k-lemma to start with. So we have to build this toy. So what we think about is u. u is going to be the set which I want to build, I want to, I want to build the potential form for. This, this phi is called the potential form for beta. Because what it's doing is it's playing the same role as potential energy does for a force. You differentiate it, you get back the force. You differentiate it, you get back the form. It's a potential energy, essentially. The generalization of the idea of potential energy is what it is. So the picture is this. We have the u we're trying to find the potential over, and then we take the Cartesian product of that with the, with, with the interval 0 to 1. This gives us some sort of like stack of pancakes. It's, you know, it's, it's a bunch of copies of u. And we want to think about t equals 0 being this copy of u, t equals 1 being that copy of u. All right? And then we have these maps. J0 and J1. J0 maps U to that. J1 maps U up there to that. And so J1 is from here to here. J0 is from here to here. But they're a little bit different. Like J1 maintains X and J0, um, well, they both maintain X, don't they? I'm an idiot. Blah, duh. Okay, anyway, moving on. But what's more interesting is what they do in terms of pulling back. See, if we look at the cylinder, we've got the, the coordinates of u, which could be like x, y, or x, y, z if we're in three dimensions, right? Just x, y if we're in the plane, u is the subset of the plane. But then in the cylinder, we've got x, y, z, and also the t, which is along the, you know, the direction of the cylinder. And so t equals 1 at the top, t equals 0 at the base. If we can pull, so here's a, here's a one form, for example, that's defined on the cylinder x plus t dx plus dt um, in one dimensions. So you can pull back, just, this is just a toy example, 
pullback under the J0 and J1 maps, the pullback of omega. Remember how it works, we just plug in t equals to 1. I'm sorry, um, J0 was what? t equals 0, right? So we plug in t equals 0 into here, what happens? You get x dx, you got that 0. So the pullback of omega under the J0 map just gives you x dx. On the other hand, j equals 1 essentially is just putting t equals to 1 and leaving x by its lonesome. And so this pulls back to x plus 1 dx. So <clears throat> we define then this k mapping following, I think, Poincaré, most likely. Maybe Carton. I'm not sure. One of these guys. This is in all the books going way back. This I found in, in Flanders differential forms book, which is from a math engineering seminar at Purdue in the 60s. Wow, that's quite a seminar. But anyway, um, but Flanders is a, is a, it's a, man, it's a hard book to read. But um, anyway, here's the K map. So we, 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 we say that if you've got a t comma x dxi, just send that to zero. If there's no dt appearing in, in the form, the p form, on the cylinder, then that, that just maps to zero. On the other hand, if there is a dt in your, in your p form, what you do is integrate it away. Just integrate out the dt, integrate from zero to one over that. Get rid of the dt by integration. So this gives us a way to trade um, p plus one forms on, on the cylinder for p forms on u by systematically removing the dt's in this way. And it turns out that there's this k lemma that holds for k. k d omega plus d k omega is the pullback under 1 of omega minus the pullback under 0 of omega. This calculation is completely easy to follow. So there's two cases. Either your, either your form on the cylinder has a dt in it or it doesn't. All right? And if we can figure out what happens on the, on the monomials, then we can just take sums of these to build it for everything. So we just look at the monomials, the things that are built from not sums of different wedges, but like just. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, this one, by definition, k of this omega is 0. So clearly, d k omega is 0. All right. So what's d omega? Well, d omega is d a wedge d x i, which in detail is this. OK. And then, then what? then we <clears throat> calculate k of d omega. k of d omega is k of this stuff. Now, this stuff is automatically 0 because it's got no t in it. So by definition, that goes to 0. This, we integrate the dt, like so. But then fundamental theorem of calculus says that that's a of x1 minus a of x0. But that is precisely the pullback of dx. That's the pullback of omega under the 1 map, that's the pullback of omega under the 0 map. So you have the difference of the pullbacks. Case 1 done. Woohoo! K lemma true. Now case number 2 is a little bit fussier. Case number 2 is when you actually have a t in your omega. In that case, you can calculate d omega as such. This piece goes away because dt wedge dt is 0. This piece survives. Um, but then I can reorder things because of the anti-symmetry of the wedge. It gives me this. Um, so that's my k of d omega. I can pull the sum. Uh, let's see here. So then definition of k says I integrate over the dt. And um, so doing that gives me this. At this point, I'm stuck. All right. Fine. So what do you do when you're stuck? Work on the other term. So the other term, which would be k omega, we're supposed to calculate d of k omega, k omega is this. d of k omega would be that. So what's the differential of this? Well, <clears throat> if you think about it, it's got no time dependence because you integrated the time dependence out, right? So it's got no time dependence, so the dt term is 0. And that leaves you with this, which leaves you with that. But that's exactly what we had up here without the minus sign, so they sum to 0. And in this case, this plus this is 0. And by the way, the pullback of this omega, both of them were zero. If you go back and look at what it was, because there was a uh, there was a dt in it, so that dt pulls back to zero, which kills everything else. It's like the two in my example at the start of today. And there you go. That's k lemma. It's like okay, great. How does that help us? That brings us to an important definition, topological definition. If we have a subset of R n which is deformable to a point, 
what's that mean? That means that there exists a smooth mapping from a cylinder over the space. So like you take the, the unit interval cross i to u, such that g of 1x is x and g of 0x is p. So you can kind of envision this as being some way of shrinking your space u to a point. All right, it's a shrinking, it allows you to deform <clears throat> the space u to a point. That's the, this is a mathematical characterization of that. And so what, I'm, what I want to think about then is what that means is that g composed with j1 is of x is x, and g composed with j0 of x is p. But what's that mean? That means that g composed with j1 is the identity, and g composed with j0 is p. Well, these are wonderful because we know that the pullback plays nice with these kinds of composites. <clears throat> In particular, we can calculate the pullback under g composed of j1 of gamma, which is the identity. So I get that. On the other hand, <clears throat> the pullback of gamma under j0, well, that's the constant map. The constant map pulls back everything to zero. It's stupid. So this is automatically zero. So you go and apply the k lemma to this form. All right, and that gives me this. But again, what did we have? Um, it gives us this. Now, so what, then, then what happens? So th this, by the way, <clears throat> we can rewrite as, and I didn't prove this, and I'm sorry I haven't proved this. I really wish I had, but it's, uh, yeah, you know. Um, so this is, I can pull the, I can, it's this property over here. It's the, the pullback and the differential commute. So I. I have, that's the pullback of the derivative of gamma. Okay, so think about it. What if gamma's, what if gamma's closed? If gamma's closed, what happens? D gamma is what, by definition, zero. So that means that this, which is that, is the pullback of zero. So this piece goes away. So if gamma's closed, you've got this equation. Gamma is the differential of that. So this is my potential form. Yeah. This is nice. This is not mine. Definitely not. Um, so proposition, if we have a subset of R which is deformable to a point, by the way, the punctured plane is not. The, the puncture in the middle is keeping us from deforming it to a point. The point has to be inside the space. So you're thinking. Um, <clears throat> then a P form on gamma is closed if and only if it's exact. This is the Poincare lemma. And so, the, I mean, it's just, this is just rehashing what we just did. You know, so we, we get this formula which shows you that that's the potential, that's the phi, which. And <clears throat> just to make sure you believe me. Oh, yeah, we'll talk about this some other day. I should really talk about it now. Oh, well, too late. Too late, too late. Some other day. Uh, so how about a one form? And how about R3? What happens to one form? One form, suppose you have an exact, it's going to be a closed one form in three-dimensional space or at least a, deform, a subset of R3 which is deformable to a point, all right? Or suppose it's, suppose it's closed on all of R3 just for the sake of discussion. What is the condition that the differential of a one form on R3 amount to? That means that the, the curl of the corresponding vector field is zero. So this theorem says if the curl of the vector field is zero on all of R3, it's, it's conservative. The, the, the spaces which are deformable to a point, those are the simply connected, those are examples of simply connected subsets of R3, or Rn. But if you sort through this here, the question is like, what does this actually do for you when you sort through that formula applied to omega f? How would you deform all of R3 to a point? Or let's be, you know, if you, <clears throat> the deformation, how about this? You just use, G of TR equals to TR. Think about that. 
when I put in 0, I get 0, right? When I put in t equals 1, I take r to r, right? And so what this mapping is doing, it's taking spheres of radius r and like contracting them to the origin in, in one unit of time. So this is the contraction to the origin map. And if you, if you work through the k lemma, work out the, and I actually worked out all the push forwards and because, you know, um, <clears throat> and sort through all the details, this, <clears throat> excuse me, this, this construction produces that which amounts to this. This is the potential, which we call usually V for potential energy. I threw in a minus sign. And you see what this is. This is the line integral from the origin to the point x, y, z along the line with, with, with direction vector x, y, z from the origin. In other words, this construction reproduces that the potential energy is the minus the line integral of the force from the origin of the potential. So this is why, in fact, people like Pancre were looking for these, looking at these questions at the end of the 19th century, is they're trying to find like generalizations of potential energy for, for objects beyond just vector fields. Like, what does that mean? How do you understand it? And you run into these topological obstructions because the obstruction is topological. And then things kind of went sideways and all of a sudden they were studying shapes of spaces by looking for differential forms which were closed or exact over those spaces. And so this is what's called Durham cohomology. It's formed by quotient vector space. What you do is you look at the set of P forms over U mod the set of exact forms over U. If every exact form is closed, then this is a trivial quotient. So the Zeram cohomology is just zero, which is to say that the shape, that the space is essentially like Rn. It's boring. It's got no holes. On the other hand, if you calculate the Zeram cohomology of something like the punctured plane, you'll get interesting cohomology like, I forget what it works out to, but something non-zero. And the dimension of these spaces are called Betty numbers. Basically, Betty numbers describe the holes which are in your shape, your space that you're studying. And this is the, uh, this is the birth of what's called uh, algebraic topology. It comes from studying potential energy in abstract things. Indeed, I did. Yeah, the, um, well, <sighs> there's a lot of different ways to do algebraic topology. So you can arrange things to be a lot of different things, but I, I, I did not misspeak. I'll just say that. <laughs> but at the same time, I hear you. But it is, it is called the, the um, it is called the group. But, no. No, that, that is actually a quotient vector space. In the Durham cohomology, this, this really is a, a vector space. But the, um, um, <laughs> you're right, I think maybe that quotient doesn't have to, I, I won't, ah. Well, anyway, we should, we should have a course in it, right? So uh, then I'll have to wait for your algebraic topology course here which might have to wait a while. You'll be here. <laughs> so sorry to, sorry to go so long, but it's for a good cause. Next time we will do musical morphisms, which we did some of in linear, but we'll get back to that. And that's not actually in McNerney, but and I'll hopefully also do um, fun, interesting things like Maxwell's equations and differential forms, that stuff I'm hoping to do next time. So. My apologies for all the things I haven't proved about properties of pullbacks, but I hope I've done enough today that you guys understand a little bit more about them. If not, harass me for more examples, I don't mind. <laughs>